Cities are particularly important, I think, for designers and architects, um, uh, in part because, well, very much uh, because they're probably the most complex things that humans have created. Uh, I don't think there are anything really more complex than this, but our understanding of them is pretty limited, to be perfectly honest. I mean, um, there was a talk that we had last week uh, presented by Andy Johar, who's an architect in the UK, where he drew the analogy that cities or, or sorry, um, architects and designers are the medics of cities. But if we follow that analogy a little bit further, do we really understand the anatomy of cities? Probably not. Um, do we have the tools to diagnose the issues um, within cities? Um, no, they're pretty limited. And even the efficacy of the solutions that we potentially bring to some of the, some of the issues and the challenges are, uh, are really limited as well. So we really don't understand um, enough about them and um, we need to put a lot more effort into getting uh, an evidence base, getting uh, a really deep understanding of cities, um, in part because, you know, for example, 50 over 50% of the world's population now live in cities and they basically power economies. So 
they're really, really important parts of, of humanity. So discussions such as this are really important in starting that conversation. Um, and I think that conversation is important as well, particularly here in Adelaide at the moment, because uh, we're going through a process of the first of a, a five-yearly review of our 30-year plan. Um, so the first review has been consulted on at the moment. And also, we've got a new development act, and a lot of the, um, the architecture, pardon the, uh, the, you know, the pun behind that, that sits behind um, that new development act is still actually being worked through. So um, regulations, guidelines, all those sorts of things uh, are being developed. And so we've actually got a point in time now where we can bring evidence and bring data and bring some really deep analytics to how cities work or how our city works and build a, a, a really rich um, planning platform around it. So in part, some of these discussions are part of consulting on that so we can give feedback to the state um, with that sort of thing. So. Um, we're really uh, pleased to be hosting this. We had a series of events back, uh, it was Wednesday last week, Rini Johar spoke, and we've had some fascinating talks both late yesterday and this morning. Uh, and this one proves to be a particularly interesting one as well. So uh, I'm just here to sort of open it and say this is the overview of the Institute of Architects hosting this with, um, with open space, but I'll hand over to Mark now, who's actually going to take you through the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Acquiring position, log on, established, downloading latest Intel package. Welcome back. Now I remember. Now I know the parts of me that used to fit together. The world around us is not as it seems. XM reserves. Seven. Seven percent. Video games form an exciting part of modern day culture. Whether created for leisure or more serious in their intent, 
video games are being utilized in more branches of society than anyone could have predicted. They're helping to shape our broader understanding of the dynamic between people and place. From the, from the perspective of those curating the public realm, there is a necessity to broaden our horizons, understanding that places are not just designed, constructed and managed, but they are also programmed. The parallels between virtual, hybrid and physical environments has become too close to ignore, raising the question, can we and should we be making video games a more integral part of our public realm experience? We have four speakers today in a slightly different lineup to the one originally advertised, but I'm pleased that we've been able to strike a balance with professionals from both inside and outside the games industry. I hope from, to I hope from today's presentation we will identify some common ground between the industries and build a platform for exciting collaborative projects in the future. Without further ado, could I please introduce our first speaker, former Lord Mayor of Adelaide and Urban Futurist at City 2050, Stephen Youngwood. Spaces 
looking at completely different ways, whether it's uh, Bay 2 in Taipei, where there was a stampede, right through to the uh, riverfront uh, on South Bank, which is, was described as a perfect storm of Pokemon, Pokestops and Pokejins. Uh, I've seen uh, people swamping their Altona for sure down in Melbourne because uh, there was a in there, even in remote parts of Melbourne, in the suburbs like Casey, uh, where the Pokejins are few and far between. That means that people make an effort to gather in places because they're special places for what they want to do that weekend. Um, it's provided an opportunity for people to not only dwell in places, but also physically move through places. Just out of interest, another quick question, who's installed Pokemon Go on their phones? A couple of hands, and that's about statistically right. Interestingly enough, 15% of all mobile phones in Australia install Pokemon Go. Uh, that is actually more than virtually any other country in the world, pretty much twice what's happening in Europe. New Zealand's about 1% ahead of us, uh, but Australia and New Zealand, where it was released first, had the highest density, other than Japan, of, of people actually playing Pokemon Go. There's a couple of quick basic things, principles around Pokemon Go that I think you need to understand to actually get your head around what some of the opportunities are. Firstly, there are Poke Stops, uh, and secondly, there are Poke Gyms. Now, a Poke Stop uh, is something that has actually blown me away in terms of how many stops there are in the CBD alone. Uh, the reality is that every piece of street art, every mural, uh, every statue, a lot of heritage buildings, uh, street plaques, um, council, town hall, community centre, the library, the list goes on, have all been tagged as places where people can physically walk up to it in the game and interact with that Poke Stop and are physically rewarded uh, with things within the game and that experience. I have a seven year old son who now knows what the experiences in games are and where they are because he knows it's a Poke Stop and he's been rewarded by interacting with that. Um, just in my own community alone, in my own neighborhood, in the southwest corner of the city, I now know the name of all the street art in my community because I've interacted with it, seen it, and continually had the opportunity to go back and be rewarded with it. So the Poke Stops are all around, and there's countless stories of community centers and libraries being inundated with people coming in uh, to interact with those Poke Stops. The other one is a Poke Gym, and that is a different kind of nature in the sense that people gather at these spots, uh, potentially for a period of minutes or hours, to actually battle with their Pokemon to own that space. So whilst the Poke Gym is somewhere where you can move through and connect to, a Poke Stop is a destination where you go and you dwell. And it has uh, like different land use types, it has different land use outcomes uh, in it as well. There's one probably other element that's worth adding, and that is the need of the Pokemon to lay or hatch eggs. You put them in an incubator, and you only hatch the eggs after you walk a certain distance, whether it be 2 kilometers, 5 kilometers, or 10 kilometers. And you know you're onto something quite big when your 7-year-old son uh, walks up to you on Saturday morning and says, I need to go for a 5 kilometer walk today. <laughs> so, yes, there are, have been a tremendous number of issues with Pokemon uh, go. There was a mugging down the semaphore at 2 o'clock in the morning. Who hunts Pokemon in the middle on the foreshore at 2 o'clock in the morning? And maybe that's natural selection. I'm probably going to get tough on the go. Um, uh, and also, there's been a whole pile of reports in the media. But you know what? Shock horror, and I do have a little bit of experience in this place. That's what the media like to do. Uh, but the literature, certainly from place making organisations uh, such as PPS, uh, and New York, lot of work in that way is the net. Uh, the net has been a benefit to cities and the activation of cities in ways that we otherwise weren't able to do. Uh, one particular graph I liked uh, was the ability to track data from jawbones. Jawbones are like fitness uh, and a direct correlation between people who have jawbones and also were actually tweeting or using social media about Pokemon Go. They saw about a doubling of the number of steps that those people every single day, the moment the Pokemon Go uh, was announced. And yes, we're starting to see uh, places being used uh, in a whole pile of different ways. If you do want some tips, uh, Semaphore is the place to be. Uh, and if you haven't seen, go down to the foreshore and you'll see all the people sitting there. Um, I have talked to the council and they are starting to think about 
about what they might need to do in that space. Uh, the Melbourne Riverfront is a great place, um, as, as is uh, the Sydney Harbour, uh, but also it's the regional places that I think really benefit from. Frankston Foreshore is a really busy place as well, and I mentioned Hobson's Bay as well. So there are, for me, a huge range of issues and opportunities that, if understood, can be outcomes. And I haven't got long to talk about it. And so if you want us to talk to Dill, to this, we'll either have a conversation later or I can come to your workplace and do a Pokemon Go Citizen Streets Masterclass. Uh, but the opportunity to look at where the Pokey stops are and whether it's a perfect storm of two or three Pokey stops right next to each other that create an environment where people can gather, cast out nets using lures and sit there and just rake them in. And there is one really good example, and that's uh, the Rotunda down by the river here in Adelaide, where there are three Pokey stops. And there are other places where you see people specifically gathering to catch uh, Pokemon. Uh, or is it the linear nature of encouraging people to move through environments? Once again, the riverfront, both in Melbourne, here in Adelaide, are uh, unique and, and even set for a unique linear opportunity for people to go along and connect with different Pokey stops, get the rewards, hunt Pokemon, and actually also move at the same time. You often see people literally just forming in circles around these focus stops because they want to keep moving and have to hatch those damn eggs. But, and of course then there's the Poke Gyms. And if it's worth mentioning at the moment that I've looked at all the Poke Gyms here in the city and sometimes they're in small laneways, those Poke Gyms were identified through ingress. That is, the Poke Stops and Poke Gyms were actually crowdsourced through ingress and the anti to ingress and they then went on to do Pokemon Go. Uh, and the opportunity to potentially move some of those Pokemon from small laneways into each of our city squares to create spaces where people choose to gather is quite important. Um, one great example is that um, some of the squares don't have a Victoria Square, the fountain, uh, which was moved in south, in my term is Lord Mayor, is a Pokemon gym where people uh, can gather. Interestingly enough, and this will give you an indication of the significance, McDonald's is going to deal with the anti to make all McDonald's in Japan Pokemon gyms. The question I want to you is do you want public spaces and parks to be places where people gather the digital uh, augmented reality geospatial game, or do you want them to be at uh, McDonald's? And if McDonald's is doing it, there must be something in it. But the opportunities, I think, in particular for this summer, whilst it's still bubbling away. Uh, are quite uh, significant. Temporary seating and lighting, entertainment, getting the buskers out there to interact with those people. Uh, dare I say, food trucks uh, might be a really good idea, and some people disagree with me. Photo competitions to be able to use the augmented reality nature of the cute Pokemon uh, to actually represent and show uh, and feature your environments. The opportunity in Singapore to have a Pokemon Singapore. Uh, augmented reality photo competition to people and start promoting uh, that privacy um, as well. Uh, and of course, uh, potentially working with small businesses in Main Street environments uh, because we all know I love a good road closure. So, is it a fad? Absolutely. There is no question right now, Pokemon Go is really big. Uh, yes, it is now starting to decline, but there are lots of other fads in life as well. Um, and I, you know, I could go on, uh, whether it's a yo-yo or a skateboard, uh, other computer games, uh, and as a futurist with City 2050, even one day cars will even be seen as a fact. Um, but we must acknowledge that this was the biggest mobile phone game in history. Uh, I think it had something like 100, uh, 100 million down, no, that can't be right, I'll get my numbers right, I didn't bring them with me. But it has had a huge number of downloads, and it certainly has been the most downloaded game in history. And interestingly enough, the three day retention of Pokemon Go literally thrashed any other mobile phone gaming app. And so I think we'd be very foolish to brush it off, we'd be very foolish to underestimate it. But if you do get a chance, as a landscape architect of the manor, as a city enthusiast, to download it and literally hold your phone and see what the world looks like through the geospatial augmented Pokemon Go uh, reality, uh, you'd be 
fascinating to see what it's like. Um, the truth is that pretty much every significant landscape in this square mile, in metropolitan Adelaide and in cities around the world, has been tagged through a crowdsourcing process and it is here to stay. I like to say that uh, Pokemon Go or the Ante has laid the railway tracks of the gaming future. They've made some substantial money on this. They're here to stay and I'm sure they're thinking about what's next. What's next. So whether it's Ghostbusters or Harry Potter or, or even just today, I, I was able to connect my phone uh, to my Qantas app and get frequent flyer points for the amount of walking that I do uh, because of health insurance that connected through my phone and through Qantas. We are starting to see cities in a whole new light uh, and I know we've got some other experts to talk about it in a little bit more detail uh, and I really look forward uh, to seeing what happens in the near future. I want to thank you for your time and uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be here today. Cheers.
digital gaming itself has undergone a rapid evolution over the past 40 years. We've seen the widespread domestication of digital gaming devices. A recent Guardian article highlighted for a time, video games offered uh, a level of physical and social interaction in the arcades or through multiplayer social games that friends and family had to play at the same time in the same room. Then multiplayer games moved online, fellow players became physically removed from one another, if not completely anonymous. To the surprise of many, it hasn't been any domesticated game systems that have proven to be the most flexible in introducing games to the masses. It has been the humble mobile phone. Although location-based mobile games have been around for some time now, it's the emergence of Pokemon Go that has caught the imagination of the public. The number of people playing has caused everyone else to take notice. But what seems to have been reported prolifically is where the game has gone wrong, rather than the many ways that it's gone right. What it has done is forced new questions on how it can be successfully integrated, which I believe can help advance our understanding of how games can enhance the experience of the public realm and educate people over their benefits. The Digital Australia Report provided us with some valuable statistics in relation to the video game industry. An updated report of reporters is due next year, but 2016 report is still of interest. The diversity of people playing games and the frequency they play them highlights the cultural significance of the industry. When we talk about play in the public world, by default we might think of playgrounds in a specific demographic. In the context of video games, all age groups play games, and they account for 68% of the population, about 16 and a half million people. The average age of a player is actually 33. People who grew up playing games have continued to play them. This forces us to think more broadly about the notion of play. So why are we playing games? The most prominent reasons cited in the report were to have fun, keep our minds active, and relieve boredom. It was the last side of reasons that caught my attention. By comparison, we are less likely to play games to learn, exercise, or socially interact, which were all commendable attributes of playing games. But I think that gamers are not really used to this, to these attributes, and if they're pushed on them too heavily, turn them off. It's a balancing act, but one that cannot be ignored. The Hart Foundation noted that there are both long-term and short-term impacts of the long city. These include an increased, increased risk of becoming overweight or obese, <coughs> diabetes, cardiovascular disease, premature mortality, and an increased number of musculoskeletal conditions and eye strain. Encouragingly, they noted if games like Pokemon Go can get people active and improve their heart health as a result as they go for it, we all need to minimise our prolonged sitting by breaking it up with periods of activity. As adults, we do have a recommended level of weekly exercise. If we take those figures and compare them to the average time spent playing video games, a reported 88 minutes a day, there's a clear opportunity where outdoor gaming can have a healthy impact. It is surely only a matter of time before studies occur to determine the extent of those health benefits associated with Pokemon Go, and it won't be the first time a study of that nature has occurred. Active behaviour encouraged by the Nintendo Wii created interest on the domestic front with games like Wii Sports. Whilst the study did confirm that Wii Sports didn't burn as many calories as actual physical activity, this is really where mobile, go mobile games have stolen a march on their domesticated forebearers. For example, Again, Zombie Run encouraged players to sprint at intervals in the outdoor environment to escape hordes of zombies. It was, a, it was unique in that it didn't rely on screen time for players to participate. Many of those games, however, have lost momentum as, because they simply rewarded players in achievements, uh, but they became meaningless as the novelty wore off. Uh, but games could do more. So where else have video games and landscape converged? I recently read a simple but effective definition of what play is that links in with well with some of the other work I've been doing. It goes, play is the fiction of doing. A significant part of play is the narrative we assign to, and I think this is an essential ingredient to the game's physical play and the broader landscape. I have recently been involved with Story City, the choose your own adventure style story app, which connects people with place via fictional stories. The app empowers the reader 
to make choices on whether or not to explore, linked by decisions made in the fictional narrative and guided by GPS. Further to current location-based games, the strength of the story city lies in the ability to capitalise on the work of local writers, musicians and artists. Each story is unique and actively links in with the context of the real locations. For the Port Adelaide edition of Story City, We've been working with a local primary school, testing stories, generating art and creating music to include on the app, providing an authentic experience that will resonate with locals and inspire visitors to explore the area. Whilst many location-based games are made for a mass market, Story City demonstrates the flexibility to adapt to the game content and power of the local population. There are other games emerging that offer a close relationship to the landscape by making their input an integral part of their game. I discovered the Quest Game app recently, which empowers players to scan for and fauna outdoors, which they are rewarded for in game. This reward varies depending on the rarity of the species. It's an excellent mechanic of how games can build up a database of useful information that has already been endorsed by multiple agencies, academic institutions, and mechanical groups. Interestingly, a similar scanning process was also an integral part of the recent game No Man's Sky, which embedded the flora and fauna on procedurally generated planets for gamers to explore, and were also rewarded as part of their discoveries. Unfortunately, our public realm doesn't often embrace the opportunity for play and games. Play spaces are broadly accepted, or a broadly accepted location for play to occur. Uh, there is a saying, nature doesn't stop at boundaries, we draw for it, and perhaps neither does play. Some of the biggest struggles in the public realm has actually come from play equipment designer manufacturers. Some equipment has been adapted to incorporate button operated light and sound based games. The games require a combination of movement, balance, and speed, and has been pioneering in many respects. This fusion of digital and physical, this fusion of physical and digital components has been described as play where it might just be the play space is what one was in the domesticated games industry. These integrated playware games don't rely on a screen, uh, allowing for the conventional physical benefits of play spaces to flow naturally, whilst engaging children in a hybrid play experience. There have been other play spaces that have incorporated brands as part of their theme, in addition to mobile apps themselves. Rovio, Enstein, and Lapset, who are represented by Active Recreation Solutions in Australia, combined to develop a series of angry bird play spaces. The association with popular culture helped to raise the profile of the play spaces in a similar way to the use of Pokemon as part of the Antic publications. There are, however, some peculiar measures emerging elsewhere in the public realm to address mobile gamers. The introduction of smart paving uh, and similar measures removes individual accountability and takes away from the liberty of self-assessment self and freedom of movement. And it harks back to the brutalist urban design approach of the 60s, where the board of the tax to guide people. Back in the world of video games, landscape architects from Fletcher Studio in San Francisco actually worked on a video game called The Witness. It was an island-based first-person puzzle game. Like numerous open world games, game environments, the non-linear gameplay and pace of the game allowed greater opportunity to observe and explore the island. The landscape was iconic, mimicking different environments and taking influence from different periods of civilization. Lead landscape architect Diana Van Buren highlighted that, given the increasing number of people who see the built environment digitally, designing environments for the electronic gaming industry can have an impact on the public's appreciation of design and on their demand for better quality in the physical world. The lead game developer, Jonathan Roy, said that the guidance and advice of the architects had helped craft the island in a way that felt more immersive for the player because all the, all the details were in place. The witness sets a precedent for collaboration between landscape architects and game designers. I've gained some insight into the creation of virtual environments, having been involved with game design course through the Academy of Interactive Entertainment using the Unity Game Engine. I'm starting to think that we have a common language on how we understand how people use place 
we're considering open world environments or real world environments and increasingly where location based games and the integration of augmented reality is being developed. But why do people play games of this nature? Speaking of his early years in the UK suburbia, Dr. Riley expressed some sentiments. He noted, video game landscapes offered me the possibility to play, albeit in a virtual space, and he experienced the nature of natural spaces I crave for. He was right that you have no desire to experience and be in the landscape. But I wondered to what extent this satisfies our needs if they're a little artificial. It is a confronting concept to think that the virtual landscapes might provide a significant part of our exposure and opportunities to explore the landscape. I would also argue that some of the most recognisable landscapes don't physically exist. The visuals and audio of games have become so realistic with compelling narratives in vast game worlds, it's little wonder that Australians are spending so much time playing. I would also note it, for many, experiencing, game, experiencing changes in the landscape rather than pursuing the goals of the actual game is more appealing than the narrative of the primary quest of the game. I've got a term that I like to use to describe artificial landscapes. These surrogate landscapes that we rode in the confines in the confines of our screens. The idea of a surrogate in shaping our interpretation of the physical landscape may seem perverse at first. But consider this: not everyone has a means of accessing rich, stimulating environments, whether it be down to location, weather, physical and psychological limitations, financial restraints, or simply a lack of knowledge that these environments exist. Urban densification, overpopulation climate change are huge global challenges that are impacting on our experience of the landscape. We could yet rely on landscapes in ways beyond the games, beyond playing games that suffer in our livelihood. It becomes a question of what does the human need for exposure to the landscape? In summary, video games add value to the experience of the landscape. They encourage more active behaviour without being the primary focus. They offer, they offer a sustainable, adaptable opportunity for place activation, and they allow a unique sense of place to develop. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I won't accept questions just yet. I'll wait until the other presentations are done, and then we can reconvene at the end. Could I now introduce our final speakers, Derek Ratte and Dan Cormick for the next phase. So why 